Hold it up. What is that? The Bible. What, what do we also call that? The Word of God. Now hold on here. I'm going to split hairs, and you're not going to like this. It's the first time I heard it. I was like, I'm an evangelical seminary. This guy's a pagan. <laughs> hold up the Bible, and we say, this is the Word of God. It's not. It's a translation of the Word of God. True? Because God spoke in Hebrew, Greek, and parts Aramaic. That's how he spoke. So that would be the Word of God. Everything else, the Swedish Bible is not the Word of God. It's a translation of the Word of God. People get a little etchy when you start talking like that. But it's true. What I'm trying to say is you have Swedish Bibles, you have Spanish Bibles, you have Greek, you have, you know, Latin Bibles, you have the King James, you have the NIV, I mean, you name it, right? The thing is, these various languages are a common mode of communication. We can still get it. And yes, it can still be fully inspired. Right? And inerrant. So, having said all that, um, remember you receiving this information. Remember that God has revealed information and you can contemplate and understand enough how to get saved. And, and by thinking of God in terms of what the theologians call via, negativa, what, what do you think that means? Exactly what it says. Process of negation. If I were to say, um, God is not that, you could say, oh, I see, he's that instead. If I were to say, God is not imperfect, see how I negate it? If I say God is not imperfect, what would the opposite be? That he's perfect. Whether or not we fully understand perfection. Via negativa. Um, you exist Right? You have existence. You possess it. God is existence. You see the difference there? God is being. You have being. Right? You didn't have to be here. Well, in a, in a predetermined way, yes, because God foreknew that you would be conceived and be in this room this minute, and He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. Right? So in that sense, you have to be here. But your being is not like God's being. Well, he's just pure isness. God is isness. He's I amness. I am that I am. He just is. He's pure I amness. So you understand now? You have existence. He is isness. He is existence. So if I were to say, via negativa, God is not finite. Like you and I, you go, okay. He is non-finite. Yeah, infinite or something like that. I, I have an idea what you're talking about. That's all we have to do when it comes to the religious language to make sense of the scriptures. Are you with me so far? No questions, right? Any questions? I know I'm going fast, but are you, are you processing some of this? Okay, cool. Alright. Um, this is uh, what Hick writes. Um, he cites the Rig Vedas, uh, that would be Hinduism. Rig Vedas means praise. He says here, they call it Indra, Mitra, Varuna, Agni. They also call it the heavenly, beautiful Garutman. The real, the real is one, as in Taoism. Those sages name it differently. So he has so far admitted that there is a real, Moving in, this was just definitions to get to where we're at right now. So we don't have to go on a tangent in the middle of everything. So, based on that quote, there is what's called the real. Okay? We call that God. The real, according to the pluralist, like John Hick, also is called ultimate reality. Ultimate reality. Now those are two cool terms, right? Ultimate reality, right? Couldn't be any more ultimate than God, right? Now the logical argument. God is the greatest being that you can conceive of. Two, it's greater to exist in reality than in mind alone. Three, therefore God exists. Think of something greater than God, you can't. So the <laughs> ultimate reality, there is a the real out there. There is ultimate reality. 
And of course, got to get this term down right now. He uses the term noumena. Noumena, and he's borrowing that from the German philosopher, Immanuel Kant. You've heard of him, right? His great work, Critique of Pure Reason. Don't read that unless you're really philosophically savvy, because it will take you to lunch in Disneyland and you just go, I'm vegan. This is just a right? So noumena, he pulls that from Immanuel Kant. This is why we can't know, you see, right? Can't know, that's the joke. So noumena, noumena, this would be up here, right? This is the real, this is ultimate reality. Noumena is up here, right? You are down here, and he, there's what he calls phenomena. Noumena and phenomena, got to know these terms. This is what I used against John, John Hick at Chapman University. He had nothing to say. It's self-refuting. A self-refuting argument is what? Self-refutation. You even know what that is? It's a statement that can't fulfill its own standard. I always lie. Is that true, Nick? I never tell the truth. Well, you just did. Liar? Oh, that's right. I can't speak a word in English. I just spoke like six or seven, right? I am not here. Well, who's talking? Well, when the skeptic walked up to Augusta, right, mid third century, so Augusta, do I exist? He goes, who wants to know? He <laughs> keeps walking. <laughs> Cookie through assume, I think therefore I am, right? You've heard these things. So bring that to the skeptic. You don't need all this, this new fancy stuff. Just go, I did it, Harvard Cafe. I was sitting there reading philosophy. Really weird guy comes up next to me, and I met him at a vegan burger, time to all out there, right? And I said, like, what are you reading there? I'm philosophy. And this is like my downtime right now, so I don't want to witness that I'm talking to anybody. I'm in my own mean world, just going to soak it up. So just leave me alone, right? You've been there, right? Yeah. The cafeteria, hey, what's up, Mary? There, I got to go, right? So you go in your car instead. So this time is finite, when I redeem the time. Don't waste time. So he says, what do you mean? I go philosophy. Oh, yeah. You know, okay. What do you mean, yeah? He goes, I used to be Catholic, then I gave that up, and became one, then I became one of those born-again idiots, you know, park your brain at the door. Now I'm a skeptic. I go, what kind of skeptic? Uh, well, you know, I said, for the sake of time, are you even here? He goes, I don't know if I'm here. I'm not sure whether I exist or not. I go, all right, ask me a question. What? Ask me if you exist. He goes, what? Just say, Nick, do I exist? Do I exist? I go, who wants to know? He goes, oh, that's a good one. Then he left. <laughs> Weird, huh? There are some, some intellectual philosophers with PhDs that believe the whole world is an illusion, only they alone exist, and you are just a figment of imagination. There's only one mind. Kid you not. That's nuts. So, noumena and phenomena. What are these terms now as we get into Hick and divine predication and all these things? Noumena is the unknown God. Almost like Acts 17, right? Paul rolls in, he's in Athens, he goes, hey, at Mars Hill, he says, I perceive that you're very religious people, common ground. You have literally a God, you know, for every, there's a name for every God. There's even a God out there. It says, to the unknown God, in case you left one out. He says, that's the one I'm going to tell you about. And he gets into natural theology. He paraphrases the Psalms. He paraphrases Romans 1, and then he ends up with the resurrection. Right? When does this class end? Four Praise God. Dude, that's you, huh? We're just getting started. Um, so, to the unknown God. For John Hick, Noumena and phenomena are his terms that he uses to justify all the major world faiths are salvific. All right? So noumena is the real, the real one whom is unknown. You might want to drop that one down. The real or ultimate reality, God, Thetos, Yahweh, Elohim, part of the noumena. He is unknown. He has not revealed himself specifically like you think, which means this just went out the door. Special revelation just went out the door. 
Yumana is the unknown God. Ultimate reality is not knowable. Because, what? Because he is infinite. Well, John Hick wouldn't say that either. He would say, God is not infinite and he's not not infinite. Well, what is he? He has a whole slew, a whole list of what God is not. Well, what is he that don't know? He's not that. He's not that. That is called, again, remember I mentioned this before? Holy otherness. He's holy other. If I were to say God is love, and I say, I love. I love you. Does God love you like I love you? No. But you had an idea about that agape love, right? You had an idea that when we say God is love, go, well, well, that's heavy, right? God is love. I have love. Now we're getting home, right? You have existence. You have being. He is isness. He is love. He is perfection. You're not. We have an idea of what we're talking about. Mode of communication, right? That we can, you know, this is called the doctrine of analogy. We'll get into that in a minute. So noumena and phenomena, critical. God is unknown, has not revealed himself. Maybe one phrase here in this book, one phrase in the Bhagavad Gita, one phrase in the, phrase in the Quran, and a few, you know, the Old Testament, whatever. But how do you know that? You can't start picking and choosing if he's unknown. Are you with me? So God is unknown. What is phenomena? Man's mythical <coughs> interpretation about the noumena. Man's mythical interpretation about the noumena. What does that mean then? That means all the theologians, all the philosophers, all the religious books in the world are man's mythical projections upon the noumena of ultimate reality. We really don't know what we're talking about, do we? So now this one just got shot down even twice. This is myth. There is no God who spoke, and there's no you who can understand that. God in his ultimate reality is holy otherness. What you think he is, he's not. But if he's not that, what is he? I don't know. Because he has not revealed himself. That would be John Hay. Noumena and phenomena. The most important terms from now on in the next 30 minutes. Noumena. Ultimate reality is unknowable, right? Two, phenomena, man's mythical projection about the noumena, about the unknown. So, he excited the Rig Vedas, right? Then he creatively phrases it this way. They call it Yahweh, Allah, Krishna, Param, Atma, and also Holy Blessed Trinity. Now you this is like when you get upset. What are you talking about? It's not like Krishna, right? The real is one. The real is one. Those, those sages name it differently. All right? So who's really to say when, when he says God is one? How does he know? Those sages say it or describe it, noumena, differently. How can you even say that God is one? Maybe he could be mono, poly, or pan. Do you know what that is, these things? Did you have to take any prerequisites before epistemology, or this is just one of those? Are you bachelors or MA students? Or combination? Yeah. Which one? Bachelors. Undergrad. Bachelors? It's awesome that you guys are able to get that at the bachelor's level. Master this class. It's really, really important. Um, what is pan? I don't know that. Pan is all. Pantheism. Oh, okay. okay. Poly, many. Mono is one. So monotheism would be Judaism, Christianity, Islam. There would be three theistic religions in that sense. Uh, polytheism, Hinduism. And you have also Western polytheism where? In Utah. The Mormons. They're Western polytheists. They have pantheism, right? This is God, your divine, I'm divine, just like Sherman McLean, maybe even Dr. Phil, who knows? But within the realm of monotheism, there's three theistic religions, right? But understand this now. Per the textbook, we say Judaism is Islam and Christianity. But if the Jews are wrong, not Messianic Jews, if Christianity is the fulfillment of Old Testament, the promises there, 
Now we're down to having one, I mean, two monotheistic religions, right? Judeo-Christian theism and Islam. But Islam really doesn't fully qualify for monotheism. Yeah, monotheistic and that God is one, but part of theism, the belief in a personal, personal, knowable God, right? Who has personal characteristics, just like we describe God. Islam falls short because God, yes, he can lie in Islam, but he's perfect, so he lies perfectly. Wow. <laughs> no wonder they smoke so much hookah over there. Right? Because I moved easy too. If you told me that, God's perfect, but what is a lie? He lies perfectly. Okay. So, in that sense, he's also, we could say the God of Islam is arbitrary, right? You don't know if you're in or out. If you take someone out, your whole family goes to be with Allah. I kid you not. No, no, no Muslims in here, by the way. You don't want to be able to get make to make it to my car. Uh, so, you know, I have very strong, strong feelings about Islam. I just, I caught Islam last Monday for three hours, and we went for against, for against, it was interesting stuff. So, having said that, how does it know that God is one? Those sages named it. God is not an it, but at least we made progress. God is it, and there's one. It doesn't matter. Could God be one, monotheistic? Can God be polytheistic? Can he be pantheistic at the same time and in the same way? Could monotheism, one godism, polytheism, many godisms, pantheism, all this godism, can all of them be true at the same time and in the same way? This makes the study of world religions and epistemology and religious epistemology very easy because most cults and most religions fall within one of these. Yeah, there's, a, there's deism, but that's just ridiculous. Uh, there's pantheism. God is developing alongside the world, so I created the world. Oh my gosh, look at the evil, he's developing alongside with us. You know what I mean? That would be like a, another fancy way of saying finite godism, like the gods in Sweden and Norway, right? Thor. Thursday, Freya, his wife, Friday. The funny, we name your weekdays. All right. Anyway, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Zoroastrianism, Taoism, with a T, Taoism, Taoism, all fall within that. So if you know problems of pantheism, it doesn't matter if there's 500 pantheistic religions, 2 million polytheistic religions, and then 3 or 2 models. As long as you know, can give a case against each one of these, somebody goes, well, you know what? I, I believe in um, Sikhism. Well, what's that? I'm a Sikh. The guy said, well, it looks like a Muslim, but he's not. He's a pluralist. They're Sikhs. Very nice, friendly people, and they're religious pluralists. They don't think about these things too critically, nor do Christians for the most part. So, having said that, can God be all at the same time and in the same way? Can he be one? Many, not many, not one, everything, well, not everything at the same time and in the same way. Can he? No. Because A does not, does not equal non-A. Tell me Eric has shared this with you. Right? And for those of you who think that was really boring when he penned it down, now it's not so boring, I hope. Because the law of non-contradiction says if God exists, A. A is a it's, it's just, it's, it's a proposition for something, right? Um, Nick is a man. Cannot also equal what? Right. It would run if you said Nick is not a woman. It's a direct negation, right? You know what I mean? So, Nick is a man, Nick is not a man. Can Nick be a man and not a man at the same time and in the same way? No. Why? Because opposites can never be true. That's a short version. Or statements that are contradictory or mutually exclusive cannot both be true at the same time and in the same way. Are you with me? Oh, that's so narrow-minded, Nick. No, that's the nature of a thought. And try to refute this law. Well, I believe that the opposite of law of non-contradiction is true. Well, is the opposite of that true? Well, no. Well, which is it then? Try to argue against it, and you're going to fulfill it. Aristotle penned these down. Do you think he invented them? No, he discovered them, just like you discover math in nature, right? This is just, this is common sense. You were born with the law of non-contradiction. It's part of your mind, the immaterial. If not, you wouldn't be able to recognize mom and dad coming through the door. You wouldn't be able to learn. 
You presuppose this law mentally before you even utter a state statement or any sentence. You say stuff like, wake up, hey, bro, uh, blue sleeps faster than Wednesday. Like, what? Blue sleeps faster than Wednesday? Those are category errors. That's just wrong all the way around. If this law was not functioning in your mind, you would say things like that, right? And end up in the living bit. So, if law and operation is, is true, irrefutable, obviously, monotheism, God exists, many gods, all this God cannot be both true at the same, same time in the same way. Any more than Christianity and atheism can both be true. God exists, God does not exist. God exists, not a, God does not exist. Could both be true? No. No. All right. We're going to get into three more terms. And then we're going to deal with John Hick in detail. And as we refute John Hick's religious pluralism, hopefully, hopefully, what's so funny? Share it. I'm just joking. Is that the uh, Starbucks uh, lollipop? It is, huh? <laughs> What's that name, Cow Eats? Oh, man. All right, uh, Thomas Aquinas. What do we know about Thomas Aquinas? Anything? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thomas Aquinas. Let me tell you about Thomas. 1224, 1274, studied under Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, University of Paris. Brilliant guy. We got him down, right? Okay. When it comes to God talk, just think of this as God talk. When you're talking about God, talking about God, what is God like? Well, he's perfect, he's omnipotent. Uh, I slow down a little bit. What do those things mean? How do we predicate these things upon God? So, there's three ways that you can talk about God. That's it. There's only three ways. I know, what, 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 one, twos, and threes. We call this divine predication. Divine predication. Predication. The first one is um, uh, univocal. Univocal. Equivocal. And illogical. I'm writing fast. I'm going to stand for an hour. Univocal, equivocal, and illogical. Univocal, equivocal, and illogical. Very important. For everyone. Now, if you walked into, um, what are you good? Way of putting it. Ah, I'm not going to give an analogy. This is better. Univocal means entirely different. Just short. So, entirely different. Just stick with that short definition for now. Equivocal. The same. And we'll get to analogical because that's the solution to what we're talking about. Okay, so which one of these do you think John Hicks noumena, the realist one or ultimate reality, do you think he would engage in what we call univocal predication or equivocal? If we describe God as holy otherness, he would be entirely different, right? Now, let's go back an hour ago. <clears throat> when we talk about we have existence or I have love, right? I, I can choose to love. I can choose to not love. I can willfully hate, right? These things. If I were to say God is love and you have love, are they exactly the same? <clears throat> They're not, right? You have love, he is love. He's omnibenevolent, you're not. You possess presence, knowledge, right? Scientia, omniscientia, all these things, but you don't have the omnis. You're not all knowing, all present, right? And by the way, yours lives for the angels. When somebody says, you know, the devil harassed me yesterday, and then you hear about a demon possession and in Rome, someone's lying. Because he's not omnipresent. I studied exorcism in Rome. That was crazy. It was last year. So you go over there and do it. And when you're alone, you go sleep at night. You're like, oh dear. And I was like, what was that? Oh, I saw it. I'm the only, I'm the only 
only Protestant, if you will, evangelical in a room of 169 priests. And these guys are like exorcists on steroids. Big crosses like a Chevy hood. Uh, you know, and the stories that they share. Oh, man, really? And to keep it low-key, that's where they're doing it in the classroom. We did like four months in a week, like a week module. Uh, one of the most interesting things ever. Why did I do that? Because our books on systematic theology started to bore me when I get to angelology and, and demonology. You know, that's in systematic books. It's, it's just so short. And I wanted more. But you got to chew, chew the fruit and spit out the seeds when you're over there. That's for sure. So, inimical, God is entirely different. That would be John Hicks' God. If I were to say, I love my son, I love my wife, and then I say, God is love. If I were to say, they're completely separate. That's not, my love has nothing to do with the way God is love. They're wholly otherness. They're wholly different. Do you see how this would lead to radical skepticism? Yes or no? Well, if, 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 if it says God is love in the scriptures, then I can love, and I know we have agape, erotica, and bethele, and all these fancy Greek words for love. Let's just stick to love. All right? So, if I were to say, God loved the world that he gave his son, right? And I say, I love my son. Do you understand that they're separate, but are they entirely different? I would say no. We have an idea what it means that God is love. And that we have love, just like being in existence, right? If we were to say they're entirely the same, well, that would almost make you divine, wouldn't it? God is love, and I'm love too. Wait a second. They're not entirely the same, and they're not entirely different. What is analogical? Analogical was Thomas Aquinas' way of solving these two. Solving these two. Analogical means, in short, similar. You already covered this in class? Analogical means similar. Do you see how that might solve this issue? Analogical. We can think of, of God and words and doctrine and attributes and characteristics in a similar fashion. Similarly, I can say God is love. Similarly, I have love. Do you see that? Do you see how analogical predication, when we're talking about what God is like, what truth is like, what the scriptures say about X, Y, and Z, and doctrines, Trinity, right? And these things, how maybe analogical predication has the least amount of problems. It doesn't lead to radical skepticism, and it doesn't make you divine. <laughs> see how that works? So, now... If we remember, there is a mind capable of sending a message, that's God, right? He communicates to us in a common mode of communication that we can understand, even though we have finite minds and He is infinite. We can use some via negativa saying God is not finite. We do have an idea of what infinitude is, right? Infinitas. So this is very important. This is where we also enter into the world of anthro anthropomorphisms. Do you know what that is? Anthropos is man. Anthropology is study of man. Anthropomorphisms is where it says in the scriptures, you know, God, uh, the Israelites have now rebelled, and he says, you know what? As, as, a, as, a, as a hen wanted to gather her chicks, you know, that's how I pursued you, but you were not willing. God is not a chicken, right? And in church, when you sing, he is the air I breathe, he's not the air you breathe, he created air. We're not Christian pantheists. Right? So, same thing there. Analogically, you can say, oh, God is actually using the illustration of an animal. He's not an animal. These are anthropomorphic or human or animalistic terms that describe a point. You with me? Still true, even though he's not a head. But just like a head, care when you gather her chicks, right? You were unwilling. So, God is precisely the opposite, would be equivocal, right? Uh, analog analogous predication, we describe God similarly in uh, the same way we would say about you. You have love, He is love, etc. Here's a few examples, you have to write this down. God is being, God is light, uh, God is self-existent, God is love. We learn to love, we have love, we possess a dependent existence, right? We're dependent, we're contingent beings, God is pure act, you have potency or potential. 
You didn't have to be here. He is light. We have light. We have being. He is being. God is infinite. God is not finite. God is everlasting. Angels and man are not, right? God is my rock and my salvation. There would be another one. And now there is God time. When we say God is like a rock, does that mean he is gray granite? No. That's a poetic way of describing what God is like. So if we strip the rock of its grayness and its shape, what's left? Strength. Right? So God is my rock. In short, he's my strength. He's obviously not a literal rock. All right. Let's move on. We're going to wrap this thing up. Let's write down religious pluralism, problems with religious pluralism, and definitions of truth to try to clean this thing up. If a thing is true, getting back to A cannot equal non A that we have up here. If a thing is true, then whatever contradicts that thing cannot also be true. Right? If a thing is true. If Jesus really was whom he claimed to be, the way, the truth, and the life. Whatever contradicts that truth cannot also be true. You know, if I walked in and I go, hey, I'm also the way, the truth, and the life. You already know that. Both of them can't be true. Both could be wrong. Could be a third alternative. But contradictions can never be true. So the question is, if the thing is true, and if it is true, whatever contradicts that thing cannot also be true. All right? So truth by definition, then. Remember I said pluralism is exclusive? Getting that out to pluralism. All the major world faiths are salvific. Inclusivism in the middle, no, they're not. The blood of Jesus is applied to them in their ignorance. And then exclusivism, only one religion is salvifically true. Remember I said that, I said to Hick, I said, in the name of pluralism, you claim to be so inclusive of all the world faiths, but you exclude the religious exclusivists. Remember I said that? That's where we're headed right now. So, keeping all these terms in mind, I'll leave you good notes. Because I know it's a lot, and I'm sorry, but we've got to do this right. Um, truth, by definition, is exclusive. Can you agree on that? Truth, by definition, is exclusive. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. So when someone says to you, I don't believe that, that, that's false, that's not true, and you ask them, well, what, what's true? Well, this and that. They obviously believe that they have the truth. And you've also talked to the epistemological, epistemology class, right? The epistemological relativists, what do they say? There is no truth. How's the quickest way to dismiss that when you talk about the nature of truth and John 14, 6, and John Hick, and the skeptic who says, there is no truth, bro. What do you do? You say this, yeah. what is that you're saying? Because that can't be true either, right? Okay, so real quick now, let's flip the tables so really fast. This is what you want to learn. This is what you learn in logic. When you take your logic class, rewrite the book on three by five cards. No, that's how important it is. So, tell me right now, there is no truth. We're going to roll play. There is no truth. There is no truth. You might want to write that down. There is no truth. I'm going to ask you a question. Is that true? No. <laughs> because if he's correct, there is no truth, says Bob. Jim says, is it true, Bob, that there is no truth? Bob goes, hmm, wait a minute. I didn't expect that. You can say, if it's true that there is no truth, we have one truth. The truth that there is no truth. That's a pretty, that's a bad launching pad to launch a worldview, right? Because chances are, if that's true, your first statement to launch your skepticism is there is no truth. If that's true, we have one truth, and it's probably true too that there's a table here. There are trees outside. There's you and I talking right now. I just named four or five truths. Oh, there's a moon out, right? Worse yet, this one's harder to get. Two, if it really were true that there is no truth, 